Okay. Okay, so uh, thank you, Kira, for reminding me. Uh, I would like to introduce first uh, Karolina Stimanski. Uh, she is a neuroscientist uh, living in the Azores. So everybody jealous of her being <laughs> in the midst of the beautiful islands off the coast of Portugal. Um, think, of visit, think about visiting her. Uh, she just had a baby a few months ago. So she's a new, uh, a fresh mom, right? And I hear she's passionate about ballet. Uh, is Dancing that true? in general, but ballet also, but all kinds of dance, actually. Okay, great. And we have our Anna Kira Bich. Um, she is a cat lover. And after years and years of uh, living in apartments where she could not have a cat in or the landlords were not open to it, she now finally has a black cat called Jazz uh, that she spends a lot of time with cuddling. Is that correct? <laughs> it's correct. He spends a lot of time on me cuddling. But I'm a proud uh, cat mother now. <laughs> exactly. So cat people, he does the person. Uh, she's moved uh, from Ljubljana to Nuremberg and to then to Nova Gorica, so Slovenia, Germany, and back to Slovenia in a year during Corona. So that has been a lot of moving. Um, and uh, yes a really, really passionate also uh, explorer of, um, and I would say user of game design or trying to put gamification into everything that we do together. So really excited to hear what we uh, have in store for us today. So I will pass on to you, ladies, go ahead. Thank you. Karolin, do you have something to share for the, the first few minutes? Um, for the first one, I thought the, the game design was the perfect um, over introduction to, should we start with the, with the warm up? Ooh, yes, yes, yes. It's such, a, it's such a bridge, it fits too nicely. It's perfect. And I would suggest everybody um, to put uh, the gallery view. So on the upper right corner of Zoom, you have a gallery view. And with everybody who has the video, thank you, you guys. We can see each other in the same screen. So that's really nice. Yes, Karolin, what do we have to do? So what we have to do is um, in the neuroscience meets design, we'll talk about where we'll soon talk a bit about synchronization. And um, so what we'll try to do now is synchronize with each other with our hands. So we will hold our hands up like this to start with all of you. And now what we're doing is basically we're just doing some hand movements. I'll start so we get it. And you are trying to synchronize now to me and now to whoever you want. You just look at the screen and we're all trying to synchronize. I'm not giving it anymore. You just look at someone and trying to synchronize with them. That's the task as much and as you can and let's try to keep it nice exactly nice fluid movement <laughs> really slow. nice and slow and fluid exactly Yeah, we've tried this uh, uh, in face to face as well. It works in a similar way. <laughs> so, Karolin, tell us why are we doing this? So, we are doing this because actually there has been kind of come neuroscience research on the. Oh, now I can't concentrate when I'm looking and trying to. So, thanks a lot. Change your first stop the warm up to be able Multitasking. to. Multitasking. Uh, thank so you, everybody, has... for doing this for us. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, no, so had, there has been some research that showed that actually bodily synchronization um, is something that's very pervasive to humans. So, for example, when you, when you rock on a chair, um, and someone else is doing the same next to you on a rocking chair, you always come and end up in the same rhythm. 
So humans have like a tendency for bodily synchronization um, and sort of synchronization works at different levels. And, you know, also the thing that kind of when you do kind of the gestures you do, if the other person does the same kind of synchronizes or mimics you, um, then you find them more um, more likable. So there's all kinds of things that, that have to do with bodily synchronization. And now neuroscience also has shown that um, when people work together, also their brains synchronize. And part of this um, that's driving the synchronization is body movements. And there has also been shown that the more synchronization you have between your brains, um, also again, the more you kind of feel as acting as one team, for example. And that's why we're trying to kind of do a bit of bodily synchronization in this Zoom to make us all feel like a team, um, which of course doesn't work one-to-one, -one, but that's the idea behind it. And Alma, we have a hand up. Is it is it an intentional hand? No, it's, a, it's just a, okay. A friend of mine recently had that. She always was giving the thumbs up and she had no idea why. <laughs> okay. It's good, but don't, don't feel free to use the, the chat. Um, even like, yeah, raise your hand if you have any questions. Um, we're really happy to answer them during our presentation or at the end uh, during the Q and A. Okay. Yeah, and Anna, should I should I continue then with talking a bit about sort of uh, design and neuroscience outcomes together? Altogether? Maybe I would just like a few words. Like, who are you? Yeah. I know you well, yeah. Yeah, but maybe some true. people don't know you that um, well. Yes. That's true. Yeah, so um, I have, so I have a, my background is in neuroscience. I studied neuroscience a, a long time ago already. And um, for a while, like I, I worked in decision making a bit and was really interested in sleep and time perception and in consciousness. Um, but then I also um, got into the world of design thinking and got really interested in teamwork and also facilitating teamwork. And so I switched over to social neuroscience and did a PhD on the neural basis of team dynamics. So basically what is happening in the brain when people work together and uh, yeah, during teamwork. And you know, what are the, what, what happens in the brain during good teamwork and can neuroscience help us to figure out what good teamwork really is and why it's good and, and uh, what is different from bad teamwork kind of at the brain level. And um, then I yeah, continued research in, in, in this. And then since I also liked really working with teams so much and uh, doing some facilitation and moderation, um, I decided kind of to join my two worlds. And um, I'm now trying to bring kind of the insights that neuroscience has into the world of team collaboration, design thinking, um, kind of creative, creative work. And um, with this, um, I'm, I'm working also at the HPI Institute in Potsdam. Um, the Hassel Platner Institute, where the D School is located, which is like heavily about design thinking. And there's now also a neurodesign initiative that tries to see like use methods from neuroscience in design and the other way around. And so this is me, kind of the two worlds, um, neuroscience and also facilitate and, and yeah, design thinking mainly. Nice. Maybe just a few words about myself for those that don't know me. Uh, my name is Anna Kira, and uh, my background is in industrial design, so I studied industrial design and got acquainted with service design actually quite early uh, in my studies. Um, and then when I met Anna, Anna Osritkar, uh, we, we co-founded the first institute for service design in Slovenia. So that was sort of my window into the service design arena. Um, and somehow I also started doing a lot of facilitation work. I think facilitation is an essential part of design and service design in general, because we work with teams and, and we guide people through processes. And then maybe just to connect uh, me and Caroline, a couple of years ago, I came across a, a book called uh, Social, uh, Why Our Brains Are Wired to Connect. Uh, we'll put the link in the follow-up email. And I was just amazed about the insights from neuroscience. And it felt like there's so much useful knowledge there uh, that we could use in, in service design or in facilitation, in teamwork in general. And so, as Anna mentioned, I lived in Germany last year uh, doing this project of merging neuroscience and design and soon realized that there's just too much neuroscience for me to handle. So um, I started searching for neuroscientists and I got Caroline and I was lucky enough that she replied and, and we met and not only that, we, we sort of clicked um, and we started working together. 
And yeah, that's a part for me. So Caroline, tell us a little bit about neuroscience before we talk about our course. Um, all right, so let me share my screen with you because um, some slides are always nice on this virtual world. Um, so neurodesign, wait, I think I need to close one window. It seems to be too slow. Um, no, it should be fine. Um, so neurodesign, basically, um, for me, um, or neurodesign, that the term comes from an initiative that has been done or is, is being done in, at the Hasso Plattner Institute and also at Stanford University. Um, kind of the where the two design thinking areas or where two design thinking schools are and where there's also some neuroscience going on. And they were thinking about how could we join those two worlds. Um, and this is basically how the neurodesign initiative um, was born. And now it's really a mixture of neuroscience and neuroscience methods and neuroscience insights and kind of design thinking um, design technology also a bit and a lot of like creative teamwork really um, and so for me personally um, I'm most interested in really this part um, you know creative teamwork what do teams do what makes them a good team when is collaboration useful when is it not how can you facilitate it kind of all all these aspects are really um, what what I'm most interested in and um, um, yeah, and, and kind of there's other people, especially at the Hasso Plattner Institute, that are also looking a lot on the creative side, you know, what makes people creative and kind of look at the neuroscience of this, the neuroscience of creativity. Um, and um, then there's also a bit the link between technology and, and neuroscience in terms of, you know, how can you, there's a project that um, tries to sonify um, like brain waves. So how can you kind of listen to brain activity? So I'm sort of the design on the, the neuroscience research. Um, and yeah, I'm most focused on the collaboration side because I think that's just the most interesting part. And um, then is uh, what neuroscience used to look like was really that people were lying individually in scanners or sitting individually in front of, um, in front of um, yeah, computer screens and had EG uh, caps on their head, which you see in the first thing. So just like EG electrodes. Um, that measure brain activity or the famous MRI scanner that again also measures brain activity in an indirect way and um, shows like the famous brain scans. But what was what was like all of these studies have in common is that the research is being done on one single person that most of the time does experiments like the one you see on the screen. So they're really simple, they're very standardized and they're very repetitive. Um, so it has it's really far from from creative teamwork. Um, and then something came along, um, which is called hyperscanning. Um, and that's a technique that has now been introduced like almost 10 years ago, um, but in, in research uh, times that always feels like two years maximum. Um, and what's the cool thing about hyperscanning is that um, there's, there's the one thing is you can scan multiple people at the same time. So you're not limiting um, the neuroscience experiments to individual, VP, individual people, but you can really study interaction, um, team interaction and yeah, real life interaction. Because that's the second thing that um, some of the techniques, um, especially EEG and one other um, brain measurement technique, have been very advanced in terms of um, data analysis, let's say. And so now it's finally possible that people, you know, instead of just looking at a screen and doing very repetitive things, you can do real life experiments. So you can do things like puzzles, or there has been lots doing, um, like playing the guitar, playing cards, doing flight simulators. I have done object search um, with people. So it's, it's much more uh, real life. And there've actually also been um, one, an entire school classroom has been equipped with EG caps and like all the, the children have been studied um, during their school interactions. So there are lots of real life um, experiments now that, that can be done. and sort of that are very much closer to creative teamwork than neuroscience was before. And what those experiments have found out, um, <clears throat> they kind of called the two person neuroscience now. And the first main finding was, um, and it's one that still excites me, is that, you know, the, the saying that people are literally on the same wavelengths is true. <laughs> like people are literally on the same wavelengths, also in their brains. Um, when they interact. And then now the whole research in this 
in this two person neuroscience um, was for the past years around, okay, what is this? Like, you know, this being on the wavelengths, this brain synchronization, what does that mean? What is it actually, is it just a phenomenon? Because of course, if you're raising your right arm and I'm raising my right arm, our brain activity must be more similar than when we're doing completely different things. So is it just because people are doing similar things when they're interacting or is there really something about the interaction, um, you know, something about this team feeling about this, we're doing something together um, that is reflected by this brain synchronization. And um, yeah, the even cooler thing, it seems to be that way. Um, so this is um, like one study that I did, um, which was, uh, which, which showed that cooperation makes brains really more synchronized. So we did a study where people had to do um, a search thing, like you, you search for things on the screen and you want to be as fast as possible and you want to be faster than the other person. And when you do this, as opposed to when you're really doing it as a team and you're trying together to be as fast as possible as a team, um, then when you cooperate, your brains are more synchronized than when you compete with each other. And um, the really interesting thing was that we found that the better a pair performs, the more their brains are synchronized during cooperation. So it's really the more those two people were synchronized, the better they were at acting together at a team, as opposed to acting individually. Um, and so now there have also been other studies that, you know, for example, with lovers that found that lovers are more synchronized than friends, which are more synchronized than strangers. And there's all kinds of things that really, um, yeah, shed light on this or, or su suggest that um, brain synchronization really has to do something um, with the interaction. So really, if you're on the same wavelengths with someone, that means you can work together better. And um, what nowadays all of the neuroscience work tries to do is like finding what kind of networks are, uh, networks are active when you do this kind of cooperation or that kind of work or this kind of group or that kind of, yeah, so this is what all of what neuroscience is interested in, in looking into the different networks mainly. And um, I personally think that especially the neurodesign thing is, is very, very fruitful, and this is just starting, um, that also um, kind of neuroscientists often have no idea of teamwork, you know, that they don't know what really important is in teamwork. And so it's very fruitful to bring in neuroscience and creative teamwork and collaboration together to show the neuroscience people like, hey, you know, why don't you look into this aspect? Or why don't you look into that aspect? And um, for example, there just came a study out that looked at um, high diversity and low diversity teams. So, you know, um, if you have like a group of service designers or a group of service designers and the salesperson and the marketing guy and the user researcher together um, or whatever. And um, so it's starting to look at what does this do to synchronization? What does this do to teamwork? And um, yeah, so in general, I would say newer, newer design is now really this, um, the, the, this, the one hand fueling also neuroscience research. And at the other hand, what's interesting for us as the people working with teams, service designers, is really this how can neuroscience inspire and teach creatives, facilitators, team leads to collaborate better. Because there, so there are so many insights from neuroscience and also like from the psychological research that is attached to it. Um, that is like so interesting in terms of mechanisms, how our brain works and biases that we all have. And um, one, one aspect, for example, is that our brain seems to be un, or there's different networks active when you focus on social tasks and when you focus on content work. Um, and the two networks are work like in the opposite mode. So you cannot have both equally active. So that means kind of for us working with teams that either you focus on the content work or you focus on social things, team dynamics. And you really need time for both. You need time for like an active work slot and then you need like a team debrief. Um, and kind of this is something that, for example, service designers often do naturally. <clears throat> but looking at the neuroscience of collaboration, if you want, you find that, oh, you know, this is like an interesting starting point. This can inspire us to make it even more explicit when we want to have a team team brief, for example. Or this now makes it possible to explain to our boss even better why we need kind of time for, for social um, culture things or um, yeah, things like this. And this is what I personally think um, your design can do. And I hope that it's gonna be, or that it's gonna do even more of that in the future. And with this, Anna,
I'll hand to you and of course to everyone whenever you have questions pop them in awesome thank you so if you unshare and we just sure. get everybody is in everybody in the gallery view again so on the upper right corner you have view and then gallery view so you can see everybody so i think before we go into um presenting how we designed this course on neuroscience of facilitation we thought that we do an activity um, that's part of the course so you experience a little bit of the insights from neuroscience so what we've uh, prepared now uh, we, we created breakout rooms um, of pairs so there's going to be two people in each breakout room and you're going to have uh, six minutes so three minutes each to share a story okay and people already <laughs> going oh, away from the session <laughs> no 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 i can't scared um so ooh, more people okay so I'll, I'll try to match those that, that nobody's alone uh so basically your task is gonna be for six minutes three minutes each to share a story when it was difficult working in a group so it can be anything um just share and if somebody in the group is not there because i see a lot of people falling out oh <laughs> uh, that you come back to the main room and we'll pair you with somebody so that you're not alone okay so is it clear with everybody what your task is please use reactions if it's not clear so you have three minutes each the person with the longest hair starts and you have to share a story when it was difficult to work in a team. We're gonna give you a notification half time. It's gonna be a small pop-up at the top of your window saying that's half time and that you should switch. All right. If you find yourself alone in the room or if the other person is not responding, please come back to the main room and we'll sort you out into a different room. All right, six minutes and enjoy the stories. Okay. Okay. Oh my God, so many people dropped out. I'm alive. Hi, Edil. Oh, Giga. Giga is back. Hi, Giga. Okay, Giga, there was no till in the room? Uh, no, I decided not to join. You decided oh. not to join. Okay. Yes. So I think I will uh, then move. You can uh, pair I will me assign. Up. Or we have yeah. Udit can't. Udit said she mentioned she can't actually participate. So maybe join. Okay. Uh, yeah. Maybe put so me see. and Idil together. I'll just send us to your room. Yeah, I'm wondering how I can do that. Okay, Idil, I'll put you. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes, room 11. In room 11, okay, yeah. nice. Okay, Anna. Idil, can you join by yourself? Is that possible? Hi. Hi, I'm going to stop the recording. All right, so going a little also resolution why we did this. And just a second. We, so we have ah, because only, the other, we have people still from the rooms. I get it because it goes in five it's seconds. Brilliant. So let's wait. I guess interesting conversations going on. That's a good sign. <laughs> people not uh, instantly going back. OK, now I think everybody's back. Welcome I back. I'm so scared when the thing says you have 30 seconds left. And I'm like, okay, can't say anything anymore. <laughs> we'll be... oh. Oh. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to share the screen, but maybe just, uh, Karin, if you say just a word or two about why we did this exercise. Yeah. So we did this exercise as one of like a mini thing that you can easily also do kind of with your own team or, um, you know, with a new person even. And um, is one thing that um, you know, what I just was just saying also before this, um, the one thing is that your brain just can focus either on teamwork uh, or on social things or on content things. And another thing is that um, 
that was um, the neuroscience also found um, when you look at synchronization that kind of when you focus on a person's emotion you feel more like synchronization and the brain grows up so the more emotionally connected you are to um, other people the more synchronization you have in your brains and that's why kind of little exercises that act on emotional connection um, they can focus synchronization and again in turn um, you're likely to feel more as a team um, and you know it's also all these things always of course play on the, the the big word psychological safety so kind of if you can think of if you have like a well synchronized team that will feel psychologically safe and will usually work better together so many exercises of emotional connection and for example sharing like vulnerably a story that where something wasn't easy for you are like a a nice means of emotionally connecting you to someone on the screen. Cool. Uh, Sabina. Sabina. Yeah, I yeah. would like to just a short question. Uh, what do you actually mean by synchronizing, uh, synchronization? Do you actually, I mean, I read the book, uh, I'm a physicist uh, from my background, and uh, I read the book that they did uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging uh, of uh, Tibetan monks, you know, Buddhist monks, they mm -hmm. know how to fall into some mm -hmm. states of uh, meditation and uh, their brain waves were very nice and well ordered so what do you mean by synchronizing two brains they're not really let's let's say they're not really nicely ordered they have usually they have more alpha activity for example um and less beta activity than other people and that's something that comes up in meditation but um also late, so for the synchronization for the physicist um is really the the phase difference um, the difference the phase difference between two oscillations and how stable this phase difference is Mm -hmm. um, and so for everybody else, it's um, it's like really the the how much you're like kind of your brain always what what many of these um, neuroimaging neuroimaging methods measure, let's say, especially EG are oscillations in the brain. And then uh, the synchronization is kind of how um, parallel the two oscillations oscillate. And so how, how, how closely, how synchronized those two brains oscillate, let's say. Okay, thank um, you. So oscillation sounds like a really difficult word. What does it mean? Oscillation means um, what's the normal translation of it's it's just schwingung. Um, Waving. Schwing. <laughs> it's waves, waves. exactly. Yeah. It's it's like a wave. Exactly. Waving. It's like yeah. a wave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alexander says happen? how well a couple dances. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> does it also <laughs> happen with animals? Because I read that they have yes. this psychological therapy with uh, with the horses. And then they, they actually even our heartbeat uh, somehow uh, adapts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. heartbeat synchronization is very strong. Like that's like many of the bodily synchronization, heartbeat synchronizes, breathing synchronizes. But actually, yes, it does happen with animals. And that was one of the things that convinced me personally most about this. Yes, the synchronization between brains is a thing. Because um, there was a study done on rats. And um, it mm -hmm. showed that when the rats are more synchronized um, then they show more social behavior kind of when they're more synchronized with another rat then they're more sniffing this other rat or i don't know what the social behavior of the rat was again but something like this like they do interact more with the rats where they're more synchronized with and so i suggest we take the last question from Borut, and then we continue with our presentation and there's going to be more time at the end but if you have a question a burning question please put it in the chat and we'll come back to it at the end so Borut. Uh, sorry, I'll be quick. I'm just uh, interesting if this uh, synchronization is the same, uh, or we could say that this is a team flowing. Uh, I, I read in this book of Stephen Kotler, The Art of Impossible, how teams uh, get into flow state and then they work together. Is this uh, something, some, something uh, uh, similar or the same or maybe? I would say this is something that at least I would also like to believe. So it's still like, if you look at the harsh neuroscience, you would say it's still unclear, um, but kind of, you know, exactly what neurodesign is, this trying to relate or make meaning out of these neuroscience feelings, uh, findings, I would say exactly this, yes, synchronization, I think is, is one thing of showing, oh, maybe this is like a team that's flowing. A more synchronized team on the brain level might be one that's more flowing in their work style. Thank you for questions. All right, okay. so um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, and Carolina, I suggest that I'm, I'm going to talk through, but please jump in um, as I explain. So 
I know everybody is really interested about mirror science and, and you should come to our course when it's going to be available again. But today's talk is also about how we designed the course itself. Um, so how the process went. Um, and, and there were sort of three goals. So the goal that we shared with Caroline was developing the new course. But there were two goals um, that I had as well. And what was creating a template process for a course development. So I didn't mention, but I'm also a partner at the co-creation school, mm -hmm. which is a prototyping brand for developing different types of courses. And mm -hmm. we've started developing online courses during the pandemic. Um, so what I wanted to do with this course with Kerlin is sort of create a template that we could use with any course development in the future. And then the second sort of um, back end uh, agenda or goal was to automate parts of the process. So because this is a repeating process and the parts of it repeat every time you design a new course, um, I tried to understand which parts of the creation of the course can be automated and then actually automate them. So I think we're going to talk a little bit about the development of the course and then I'll talk a little bit about creating the template process and automation part of the process. So I think a lot of you, if you're in design or service design or design thinking or UX, you're familiar with the dime, double diamond process um, created by British Design Council, which is basically making sure first that we're solving the right problem before we're solving it right. And in theory, you will see that the, the process is like this. It looks super nice and neat. But when you actually go through the process, you see it's something like this. Um, so there are multiple diamonds that repeat. There is uh, this called grown zone, which is probably that part of the process that's really messy and you really don't know where to go and what to do. And usually that's the part where people and groups feel most frustrated. Um, so how our process looked like for the course development, we sort of had a kickoff uh, with the whole co-creation school team where we identified like what do we actually want to do. Um, and we started de developing uh, some initial activities, which we then tested in a pre-session. So that was invite only with just a couple of people and it was not the whole course, but it were, these were the activities that were the most new ones. Because Caroline and I would try to come up with our new original activities and ways how we could transfer insights from neuroscience to facilitation. And then we did three prototypes. Um, and after each prototype, we had a feedback and upgrade session. Um, we didn't plan for three prototypes, uh, but we did plan that we're going to stop prototyping when we feel 90% confident that the, the stuff that we're doing makes sense and that they work. Um, I think here it's also important to notice that this course was also designed with the intention of being delivered online. So the activities that we do are specifically designed for an online environment. Um, I think, Caroline, if we wanted to move this to a physical one, we would change probably quite a lot of things, right? I would say pretty much everything in a way, right? <laughs> because it's designed for online, so it shouldn't be done the same way offline. Yeah. Um, so, and then actually, if you think about it, so this was the upper part of the course development process, but there was this <laughs> service development process in the back, which was sort of had a different um, vibe. How would you say this Different rhythm, right? To the, to the process that was um, done for the course development. So this was doing some research, uh, creating some personas, uh, creating a customer journey that looks for anybody that attends a course, creating a service blueprint of the course, and then sort of measuring success um, of this designed process. And if that's not enough, there was a third process <laughs> uh, happening in parallel, and this was the automation part. So this was at the beginning setting up an Airtable. Um, I saw Tadej Mushich somewhere here. I know he's familiar with Airtable and maybe some other people as well. 
uh, but it's this advanced spreadsheet database kind of app that lets you um, gather data, but then also automate it and work with it. And that Anna loves. And that I love, obviously, and everybody knows that. <laughs> <laughs> and then we sort of had to think about integrations with Type 4 and Stripe. So, so how do we register people, how the payment looks like, um, then creating some templates, and then at the end, creating these automations that would help us sort of make the backend part of course development as painless as possible. So here, I just want to show you some snippets um of the process so this is how we, we worked in Miro um and this is how the kickoff looked like so you can see that we were talking about which parts uh of the process might be interesting which topics we want to focus on I think we actually had a different focus at the beginning that we ended up with Caroline right because we ended up with synchronization and desynchronization but I think the first one was about uh, how do we form groups yeah, yeah, it's actually true. I think it was because when we were looking at, you know, what, what are the, the main topics we want to teach in this, and then it became clear kind of which ones are the ones that are easier to grasp, which ones go better together, and I think this is how we eventually shifted. Yeah. And yeah, so we know which one is next. <laughs> yes. So then we sort of, we started generating the ideas of how the course should look like. So I don't, I know you don't see the details here, but it's breaking down into time slots and thinking about like main topics for main activities and thinking about the duration of the session. Mm. And then basically we made our first session outline, which looked something like this. And this outline has changed every single time um we iterated right so after every prototype of, after every feedback after every um session we had we changed it and actually we changed it quite drastically i mean we we started with a two-hour workshop we ended with two sessions of, i think of total three hours and a half the topic changed the activities changed um so the session at the end looked like nothing like the the first pre-session and actually also, I think, for example, we, 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 cause in the end, we also put in some co-creation cause we felt, you know, that the participants benefit like a lot from each other. Um, and that this is like one real quality of kind of uh, in the course, um, that we weren't anticipating in the beginning. Yeah, definitely. So this is how it looked like the session outline. And then we, so after we did sort of the high level. What are the activities? So you can see here that we have a time, we have content section, we have what is the activity and what is the workshop dynamics. Um, we sort of put that into an agenda. So the agenda had a much more detailed description of everything. Like, so we have all the different timings and who's the facilitator, what is the step? And then each step has a description of the activities. What is the text stuff in the back end that needs to be done? Uh, also, what needs to be put in the chat and notes? So this was a really detailed um, sort of yeah program for the session. And then we started inviting people. So we would we would send invitation to lovely people. I don't know if uh, Kulber is here today. I know he applied for this session, but it's actually inviting our number one fans and people that love us <laughs> and people that would be honest with us into the first session um, where they would try out stuff that was never done before so we could mess up and not feel bad about it and either be cheered <laughs> for it yeah and i think this was really nice at the beginning and they took time for this and i hope they got something valuable out of it mm. we created a registration yes yeah. <laughs> They said they did. <laughs> sure. uh, so this is like a registration, how it looked like. And then we started making the first presentation um, and having a Zoom chat. And then this is how we did the feedback. So Karin, do you want to talk a little bit about how we collected feedback? Actually, I also think that that the collecting feedback and also making sense of it later was like the crucial part. Then always in the redesign, 
And we always ask people like um, specifically what they liked, what they felt, uh, who the course was for, um, what they took away, what they learned, what they had missed. Um, and I think um, what we soon realized that it was going a bit into different directions also, of course, that, you know, some people want more theory and uh, faster and others want less and slower. Um, but we always had like quite some of the feedback that really went in the different in, in the same direction. Um, so we could really go and say, okay, let's really try to implement exactly what we what we heard there from like those three people. Um, and so we really made significant changes from one prototype to the next based on the feedback that we had. And then we could really see from one to the next evolution that, um, you know, oh, yes, this this we did well, we get no more feedback on this aspect. Um, mm. yeah. And I think at least what was a learning for me is that so we did two types of feedback. So one was right after the session, we would grab people and put it into the two different breakout rooms, one with Caroline and one with myself, and we would talk about it. So it would be this right after the session, verbally sharing the impressions and, and the emotions. Which and also get exactly that like this, this gets you the how do people feel about this workshop is really is really nice illustrated than this because they you know, you see how excited or not they are and, and what they say like, oh, I know I can, you know, want to use this for X or um, yeah, or don't say that. Yeah, and then the second part was sending a questionnaire. And it was interesting to compare the type of feedback you get from a face-to-face -face right after the workshop versus a questionnaire that people sort of fill out the next day. And, and you just have to be mindful of when you collect feedback on your prototypes, what is the context? Because uh, right after the session, people will feel a lot of emotions and there's going to be a lot of excitement. Maybe the day after, it's going to be a little bit different. Um, so I thought just that that was maybe interesting. So then you can see this is the second iteration of the course upgrade, adding more details, comments, introducing the type for registration. So why we chose type form is because you can connect it to Stripe and then it connects automatically to Airtable. So basically when somebody registers uh, in Pipefor, they can directly pay there and all the information about that person goes directly into Airtable. And in Airtable, you can set up automations that directly send a follow-up email and, and the reminder emails and everything else. So the idea was that we don't basically don't have to do anything from the moment we put the registration out to the moment when the session starts. So there's no, nobody has to check in the back and spend their time on that. Mm. So this is like a designing the, the, the sort of registration um, confirmation emails and uh, reminder emails and testing those as well. And this is how a prototype looked like. And we can see some familiar faces. Hey, I'm there, we see you there. Um, <clears throat> And then the questionnaire, like we talked about earlier, and then analyzing feedback. So making sure that uh, what keeps repeating, what stands out, and then another session upgrade and the presentation upgrade. So you can really see how we iterated every step of the way. Um, we created a working space. So in the last session, people, we introduced this thing that people co-create something during the session as well. And we decided to go for uh, slides. So there is no technical issues versus using maybe Myra. And then started promoting on LinkedIn um, and Instagram. So the, the communication channels and trying to see which channel makes more sense or where our users are. And then prototyping with mm -hmm, which is an app that lets you your image on the top of the video. So we were also trying out some new technical stuff and doing transcriptions of Zoom chat uh, because we often, in, in at least in some sessions, there, were, there was a lot of conversation in the Zoom chat and there was a lot of valuable insights and sharing. So we didn't want that to be missed. So what, what we created at the end of the session was make a transcription of all the links and comments that we would then share with our participants. So they would get even more value out of this session. And then also create resources for all the participants. So 
a summary uh, references from Caroline. Um, a lot of people wanted to read the articles, um, neuroscientific articles that the course was based on. So we really thought about different profiles of people that want to join our session. Is there anything you would like to add, Caroline? I was just thinking that actually also the follow up reading material was really something that came out of the feedback sessions like in the beginning we didn't have that yet. Because the thing with neurodesign is something that is quite is just really new and there is no standard literature on this. And all you have is like real research papers and initially, so I was thinking like who's interested in only research papers and then turns out well people are and so um, we then compiled a list of kind of, of papers that really go with the with the theory inputs we gave and um, yeah. So I think this was quite an awesome outcome of the feedback session. Mm. Cool. So before I dive into what happened in the back end, um, Karun, is there anything you'd like to add on the sort of this co-creative part of the design of the session? I think one thing that, you know, that wasn't exactly part of the thing, but that, but in a way was really crucial was um, that when in the beginning we got together, it was kind of like a getting to know each other session. And then very quickly we, we dived into the, okay, let's, you know, with two other people think about why are we doing this course? Who's this course for? What's like the most interesting thing about it? Cause it wasn't that right from the start we had like, okay, this is the goal. This is the learning like basis in mind, but we just like, hey, neuroscience, cool. What can we do? Um, and so I, I really uh, very much valued kind of this open approach and kind of we had a very, very nice and very engaged brainstorming in the very beginning. And I think this was like also a crucial part to like fuel us really into the whole thing and then getting more and more focused. Um, really like this very, like very creative mindset and, and atmosphere at the beginning, I think was really very nice. Yeah, I think that the excitement in general helped us um, to be open in a way because none of us had an agenda of what specifically we want to do but, and that actually helped us co-create better if you think about it because mm. we were both open and we were yes ending each other and building on each other's <laughs> ideas cool so as part of the background research so when you do uh, when you develop different types of, of courses um, obviously like with any other service you want to know who is your target audience like who, who are the people that are going to join your courses so i made an attempt of trying to gather all the data from the co-creation school that we had so far and these were interviews that i did and finding images and screenshots and comments from sessions because we were working mostly on Miro and feedback forums and i compiled basically everything I could find on all the Google drives and all the emails into one big Miro board. And I started tagging data. So I started um, seeing what types of data I have, um, what these pieces of information relate to and where they're from, from which sessions and from whom. And then I started clustering um, all this data to come up with some insights. Um, and I think that the biggest thing that, that sort of came out of it that was really useful was uh, uncovering different needs and why people join these kind of sessions. So I think you can see some of the, so I wanna learn by doing, I want theoretical models, I wanna feel safe, I want to meet people with different backgrounds. So there are really a lot of different needs from a lot of different people uh, joining our sessions and at that time i attended a uh, course from course design um, i think they're based in amsterdam and they introduced me to this framework of tension models is there anybody who's heard of this um supposedly it's really known in germany because it was developed by a german guy but it's basically a framework that helps you define personas. And I thought, why not use it? Why not try and learn something new? And essentially um, what you do is you gather all your data that you have about the people, um, about your users, and then you create these three opposites. You can see the arrows. 
So sort of these tensions, the three, three pairs of opposites uh, that make sense for you. And then you try and map out all the needs um, or all the, yeah, needs or expectations or requirements, user requirements into this sort of framework. And then out of that, you try to get persona types. So I started making these, um, again, tags and trying to identify information and then put them into this framework. Where do I see? Here, okay, this is how it looked like. So mapping all of the stuff. So these tensions are, let's say, change of movement. And then on the other, oh, this is moving, I'm sorry. And then on the other side, you have continuity and safety. Basically, what you try to do, you try to map all the data that you have into this framework. And then out of that, you sort of look at the content and you see what kind of connections happen. So out of that, um, I sort of identified four types of personas, which were actually later on iterated. So this is not the final version, um, but it was a way how you create personas. And then for each persona, there were this information on what is their context, so who they are, and then what are their needs in a session. Um, and then these personas were then used for communication materials and for the design of the session. So we would know specifically who we're targeting and what their needs are and just making sure um, that we set the expectations right and that we communicate what people can expect in a session. For instance, if we have a session where there's a lot of interaction, this is maybe gonna apply to social learners because they crave that they share that they listen to other people. So the, the session is gonna be designed in a way that you foster for their sort of preference. But this might not be good uh, for maybe say focused learners that just wanna you know, get this piece of information that they need and then go on with their life. So they, they have a totally different agenda. They don't need a different approach of how they wanna learn. And then, <laughs> I feel like I've been talking a lot. Karolina, <laughs> I'm not sure if you can jump in. Or I would, but I think, and you even, yeah, we already got it. But you see people like it. I was also very interested in the tangent model because the tangent model I also hadn't seen. And um, so I think it's just fine. <laughs> yeah. And then I created a service blueprint. So these were um, the prototype design process. So you can see the sessions, the estimated time, the activities, the results. What are the tools needed, the roles, and the templates? So I created this with the attempt to sort of have something that could be replicated and that can anybody could use. So in theory, if, have, if we have somebody coming in on the co-creation school team, like we had Caroline, Johnny Gus, we could just follow these steps and you would know exactly what to use and then when. Um, and as usual, uh, Testing prototype process without social media. So this was one blueprint and then with social media. And actually more that the actual output of this, which is just a huge table with a lot of sticky notes is the process of doing it. Because when you start thinking step by step and for each layer, you start seeing the missing parts. And this is where you can really then see what are the opportunities to automate? What are the opportunities to maybe cut out some stuff or include some more stuff. Um, again, it's more about the process, not the actual output. Because you can then see here, this is just humongous. <laughs> if, you, if you start reading this in the first time, I don't think you can really uh, find your way. But for somebody that does this, so for me and then my colleagues at the co-creation school going through this, this is a very valuable and helpful lesson and then we could identify like what are the tools that we need and then again what are the roles in a session and at each part at which part of the process do we need what role right so for instance we have the admin and he is more present at the beginning but then we have the co-creation school facilitator who comes in and then again we have a copywriter and admin 
So just to understand on this journey and on this course creation, what types of roles do we need? And then estimate how much time do we need for each course? So we could say, okay, we need this admin person for four hours, two hours in this week, and then two hours in next week. So it's much more easy to organize and also to plan um, a course design session. So this is the end one and the automation. Just a few words on this and then please uh, put some questions in the chat. I don't have the chat open. So basically we do with the automation, you have to understand if then is this, then that. So you have a trigger event and then you have something that happens after that event. So the first thing you have to understand is what do you need? So which, which parts of the process do you want to automate? And what are the events that need to happen? And then Airtable, I'm not gonna show you Airtable because that's a rabbit, uh, rabbit hole. <laughs> but basically it's also different spreadsheets that are listed in tabs, similarly like in, in a Google Chrome or something. And I, I sort of mapped out like what are these spreadsheets that they need and how do they connect to each other? And then creating a registration form. So I talked about this. So this is type form um, that is then connected to Airtable. So when somebody registers, all the data automatically goes into Airtable. And that triggers an event of sending a confirmation email. And then after that, sending a reminder email. Um, so this is how the database looks like. And the cool part about this is because then it's really easy to analyze. Um, if you gather a lot of data about your users, so where they found about you, um, what are their preferences, um, what is their working situation or not working situation, um, you can then go back to all the people that attended your sessions and again, learn more about them. Um, and how you can tailor. So again, it's a little bit of research um, as you get people on board. And this is also a really cool thing about prototyping is because it's a prototype and you usually, usually offer it for free or for a really low price, you can ask people to share a little bit more information with you so you understand better who are the people that you're prototyping with. This is how an automation looks like. So you can see the confirmation email. So when a record is created, send a Gmail, and you can see this is the subject and you design the message and you can put stuff in info from the spreadsheet. And this is how a generated confirmation email looked like. And yeah, basically uh, that was it. And then uh, just uh, at the end, we just tried to create that different, like a typical customer journey um, of creating a session, but that's also a, a third thing. Whew, that was a lot. I hope it was at least half interesting. I see you have a lot of uh, conversations happening in the chat. I'd be happy if there are any questions. Don't be shy. Yes, please talk. Hey, uh, yeah, I have uh, a few questions written down, so I'll, I guess I'll start with one. Um, uh, so uh, going from the top, um, I, I want to go back to Caroline when you were first uh, starting the with the hands and stuff. Uh, so. I'm curious, are there any studies that track like average human movement or like based if you see like the entire population, uh, how, what, what would be the most identifiable person to everyone? So what would that movement look like or stuff like that? Um, like what most people could identify with? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Mm -mm, I'm not aware of anything like this. I mean, they're always, they're often think this would be like a different, if you know, now you hear the baby in the background because my partner had to go pick up the other one from kindergarten. Um, and yeah, um, I'm not aware of anything like this, but also because it wouldn't be so much neuroscience. I, I think this is more like in the modeling world. Um, you know, because you would kind of need to find out what are the characteristics that people identify with. And um, usually in neuroscience it's more um 
it's really the you know if two people synchronize what networks are triggered in the brain <laughs> I'll oh, yeah, yeah, I was yeah. I was actually thinking in this direction because uh, so if you want to have like uh, if you're measuring the success of a commercial or, or anything like that, so you would basically want to have like a movement that would trigger the most pleasant reaction in the mm -hmm. someone who's watching it, right? So then okay. that would be that could be measured with uh, neuroscience, right? Yeah, but it's difficult. Like you couldn't say you know this is more pleasurable than this. Um, kind would of, you say uh, smiling, smiling yeah, faces? Because I, I think, think that's sort of like a, yeah. I mean, also there's lots of kind of newer marketing where people exactly look at the you know ads and selling, and then you always the things you use are eye tracking where you, people look to you a lot of skin conductance, like you know where do you get more excited kind of. Um, this is a measure that people would use a lot, and smiling is not such a standard measure, but oh, it's. Uh, I think it's a good idea in, in this context um but um like you can't really say so easily you know um it's not it's not that you can measure so easily like with any brain imaging things which one is more pleasurable like you can say um you know the the to the smiling face people like there's more like the pleasure center activated than to the fearful face um, but you cannot grade it, you know, as you would need it for, okay, this is something that makes more sense for the ad. That would really be more skin conductance and these kind of things then. Um, but then, you know, it would more be like newer marketing and kind of this research than um, the kind of the basic research where I'm coming from. All right. Um, so if anyone wants to stop me or start asking questions, just raise your hands. Cause... Otherwise, you'll keep on going. Yeah, I'll keep on going. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the next one is also about uh, synchronization. Um, so uh, does uh, cooperation uh, make brains more synchronized only, well, in person or online? Or when is it more um, noticeable? So I would, my first reaction would be definitely in person because there's some stuff that, for example, eye contact also has a very synchronizing, you know, let's say is a very synchronizing thing. There have been studies on this, um, and of course, you never have this. Um, it's really, um, of course, I mean, also the in the in the neurodesign field or uh, yeah, in, in this field, people are super interested in what's the difference now really in the brain um, when coming to online and and real life uh, research. The problem is the stories always take so long, so they're all running. There's lots of like I know one um, like a couple of colleagues at Stanford they're just researching this, but um, the, I don't know the results yet. So there's surely going to come something. And for now, I would surely say in person is better. Um, but they'll also be researching now kind of the nuances around it. Uh, OK. Um... And I, I would just add, um, basically, what we also do in the course is if you see the other person, it's definitely better if you don't see the other person. So having the cameras on when you work in a team together or in a project actually is very beneficial for the synchronization as well. And this is something that we also discuss in the course. Yeah, based on just based on my experience, I think that uh, if like co-working online, if you're doing something on the same project with someone, uh, it can go really much faster. But if you're if you're discussing something and also watching them something, it can have the opposite effect. Uh, so it could also be like breaking the synchronization. So this mm -hmm. is my next question. Um, but I'll wait because Sabina uh, <laughs> raised her hand. Yeah, I was just, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you, uh, is it known based on which signals do we actually perform this uh, synchronization? Is it uh, the facial expression, uh, the voice, uh, smell? whatever, body posture. Mm -hmm. um, just, I think the baby is very hungry. That's why I took my video off, but I'll, I'm here and answering. Okay, and sure. You can listen. Um, so um, so the, the, the research is currently also going in exactly this direction. Like what are the cues that make people synchronize? And, uh, you know, visual, um, visual eye contact is definitely one. Um, but there's, there's definitely other things like, you know, how emotionally connected do you feel so, to someone is definitely a huge thing. Also, why we did like this little, um, this little exercise in the beginning. 
Um, and but then you also have you have definitely other things like you know really body movement. Um, that's also why we did the synchronization. So there's lots of you know if you synchronize your body movement, then you really yeah. do have more synchronization in the brain, um, and that leads to a higher feeling of team, like being one team. But also, um, if people really feel very much as one team, so it's again kind of a thing like emotional connection, that again is a driver for synchronization. Um, so it's really there, there are many different levels um, and we're just starting to understand like what the different levels are and you know, if one maybe has a bigger influence than another, um, but it's really def many, definitely at many different, like many different things kind of make up the whole picture. It's uh, probably related also to this uh, mirror or neurons, so-called, uh, that we have in our brains. Uh, I mean, I've been involved in a lot of uh, theater uh, trainings and workshops, and there you, you actually have to perform uh, such uh, synchronization exercises at the beginning, because you somehow uh, feel the other person, so uh, how they will react before they actually react because you have to somehow um, play as a team and to predict what the others will do. So I think uh, this is a kind of similar situation to some creative teams. I think like mirror neurons are definitely they're a huge thing, like they have been a huge thing in neuroscience and they've become very fancy. So for those of you who haven't heard about them, um, they're like the neurons that become active as somebody else Kind of as a movement that you know for example um you have mirror neurons in your in your brain that become active when someone else does something so that's why they're called mirror neurons because you mirror like the mirror the other person's actions and they've been involved a lot with empathy which of course this all of this uh, is related to as well um and so i'm quite sure in a way they will relate it to to synchronization definitely um but it's really also something that hasn't been joined yet because mirror neurons is something um, like it's still not a hundred percent clear if humans really have mirror neurons. It's very much everybody assumes it, um, but mirror neurons is something like that comes from the study of individual neurons, and this is something you do basically mainly in animals. And most of the interbrain synchronization has so far been done in humans, so that's why you you cannot really look at you know are, are those mirror neurons active, but it's very likely that they are. Thank you. Okay, I will uh, invite everybody that still has questions to stay with us uh, for the backstage. And we're gonna continue now just to kind of wrap up the formal part. And I'm sure there's a lot of conversations that we can still have around this topic or even diverge out of this topic after um, the session. Okay, so just uh, quickly uh, finishing off uh, for today. Let me just share. There we go. And I will uh, pass it on to Eva. Hey. Uh, first, I would like to thank you, um, Anna, Kira, and Caroline. Caroline, like it was really insightful uh, talk and. I would say it looks that you two really synchronized, like synchronized as a team. So we do have a little individual activity in the mirror. It's um, it's a bit holiday oriented. So we will share a link in the comment. So just click on the link. You will be guided to the mirror board. And then there you will see like a big, a uh, blue square. Okay, we are moving to there. We're going to call, call everybody, everybody there. there. Okay, just slowly follow us. All right, and what we will do? Like, just select your square, type your name, like, or make up your name and just try to answer uh, these two um, statements. Just write something that annoys mo most, most people, but you really enjoy it. And what do you want for Christmas? Because we are really interested. What are you thinking about the holidays? 
So we will have how many minutes for this? Three minutes. Three minutes. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> 